In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for another uh, blessed Friday evening, 7 p.m., all the way from Sydney, Australia. I pray that those who are with us in this holy church are in good health and in good spirit. And those who are watching us through live streaming, may the Lord Jesus be with you, guide you, and protect you always. If I could ask everyone to stand for the Lord's Prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 77. I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever and will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? And I said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the ease of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O oh God, the waters saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron, and all glory be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, 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 a very good evening to everyone. How are we? Good? It has been a long time, hasn't it? Uh, feels like eternity for me. Um, what is it now, three weeks? I haven't seen you, maybe? Well, we thank the Lord Jesus for uh, the 2022 pilgrimage. I thank the Lord. The entire group went and came back intact in one piece and in good health. We had uh, a combination of different nationalities. I think the, the bus contained the United Nations in it uh, of all walks of life, Assyrians, Lebanese, um, uh, Polish, uh, Americans, uh, British, um, Greeks, all walks of life, so, and Armenians as well, so it was wonderful. So we thank the Lord Jesus um, for all the beautiful people that we had uh, on the pilgrimage, and uh, we are looking forward for next year also to be with another beautiful group, if the Lord permits it. Um, how are we? Good? Look, I have, I have to admit, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit rusty today. When I take a small break, I sort of 
come out of that rhythm that I'm used to every, uh, every week in and out. So it's been a few weeks. Um, I'm still uh, going through some jet lags. Uh, the times, I'm still yet to come back into uh, the rhythm again. You know, when you go overseas, everything changes. So um, please, you need to bear with me. I'm a little bit all over the place. Are you? You better not. All right, wonderful. Today, because it's my comeback after a few weeks break, I thought we started with a Q&A, questions and answers. Gives me a bit of a time to... Um, to refresh my memory and get my energy back. So we'll, we'll kick it off with uh, a few questions today. If there is anybody here that would like to write a question, maybe now, uh, you can put your hand up and I'll get uh, our beloved uh, Father Isaac maybe to hand you a paper and a pen, and hopefully you'll be able to answer it. If not, maybe next time. All right, first question. We've been getting these questions uh, via emails uh, from different places. They're not on the screen. So, um, yes, the first um, question. Hello, Abuna. Thank you again for all the Bible preaches you do on YouTube. I watched today Psalm 129. There is the, this big question that I have in my head for a long time and did not know how to ask. So with God's help, I will start. We hear in all the preaches the prosperity is for those who have children and their names are in the book of life. So what about the couples like us that were not blessed with children? I understand that it is God's will and have accepted it, but are we cursed? Thank you. Well, definitely you're not my beloved. Whoever you are, I have your name on paper, but I won't mention it uh, for confidentiality. But uh, I pray that you are listening and you're watching us. You're definitely not cursed, my dear. Not at all. And who says, just because you are married and you don't have children, God is not happy with you? It's quite the contrary. Children have got nothing to do with you being blessed by God or not. It is your deeds, my beloved. But I'll say this. When we come, um, clinically speaking, when we come to the formation of this baby, there is four stages till the baby is complete to come into this world. There is the stage one is called the pre-embryonic stage. Stage two, the embryonic. Stage three, the fetal. And stage four, baby complete, ready to come into this world. Pre-embryonic is the moment of zero. It is the moment when the baby is conceived in the mother's womb. That first tick. That is the pre-embryonic. Embryonic is a period between zero to two months. Fetal stage, up to nine months. After that, the baby is complete, ready to come out. A couple, husband and wife, man and woman, when they get married, when they come on the big day, stand before the holy altar, before the priesthood rank, and make their vows before the Almighty God, the priest, and all the people who are present in the church. They are giving a vow to one another before God to say, today the baby is born. So as a couple, you are this baby. When a baby comes out, is one. And what did God say in, about marriage? The two are no longer two, but one. So guess what, my dear friend? You are, as a husband and a wife, together you are this baby. So if you don't have children as your offspring, the two of you are this baby. So you are blessed, okay? So thank God for whatever He's given you and don't ever think otherwise. God loves you and be happy, my dear friend, because you and your wife, together, you are this baby. That baby was born when you stood on the big day and said, I do. Amen? Very good. I actually gave a talk about this long time ago when I was a priest. So, yeah. Good old days. Hey, first of all, my name is so-and-so. This person has two questions. Question one. 
So I would like to ask a question. If Jesus is God, why, when he was on the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, who was he talking to? This question gets asked quite often. Who was Jesus talking to? If Jesus is God, then who was he talking to when he said, Father, forgive them, when he was hanging on the cross? My beloveds, we need to understand the following. Every time you invoke the name Christ, you are saying literally, perfect God and perfect man united in the person of Christ. Perfect God and perfect man united in the person of Christ. Every time the name Christ is invoked. So, the humanity of Christ has the spirit, the soul, and the body of any human being. He was exactly like us. He had a, he had a human spirit, he had a human soul, and he had a human body just like any human being. The only difference between this man and us, he is perfect man, meaning he was born without the original sin. He is the only human being that is sinless, perfect man. That's why Jesus Christ is the only human being that is born of a woman, not of a man. When you read in Genesis 3.15, it says, the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. So Jesus is the only human being that has a mother, an earthly mother, not an earthly father. His, his father is heavenly, who art in heaven. So as a human being, his humanity spoke to the divinity. That's a, it's quite a deep topic, but I'm trying to sum it up in a nutshell to go answer the other questions. As a human being, he is totally independent to his divinity. What do I mean by that? The human side of Christ has his own will, like we do. What is the will? The will is the tool that allows us all to say yes and or to say no. Since we are free, we have choices. Since we have choices, we need to have the will to be able to say yes to this and say no to that. So as the human Jesus, he has his own free will. The human will is there. He has his own freedom. He can say to the divine his own opinions but he chose to give his will to the divine to his heavenly father and that's why he said let it be your will dad not my will when he was in the garden of gethsemane about to drink the bitter cup the cross embracing the cross so as a human being he was free but he chose willingly he chose freely for the will of the Father to be done in his life, not his own will as a human being. So the human side spoke to the divine side. Another thing, when the Lord Jesus was hanging on the cross, divinity did not interfere with that at all. Meaning, the battle which Jesus engaged himself with against the enemy, it was done only through the human side, not the divine. Because if divinity had interfered, Satan would have had a case in court. Satan would have gone to God and said, this battle is unfair. You are the creator and I am the creation. Of course I can't win against you. How can you fight your own creation? You are not fair. So the divine said, okay, Satan, I'm not going to interfere. In fact, I will allow the human side only to fight you. Yet the human is weaker than the spiritual angels, even if they are fallen. Spirits are much more powerful and, than the humans. So it was the human side of, of Christ that fought against the enemy and crushed the head of the serpent. 
divinity did not interfere so Christ perfect God and perfect man as a human being he gets thirsty he gets hungry he cries he feels the pain he feels lonely exact emotions like any humans but as the perfect God he fed the multitude with two fishes and five loaves of bread he raised the dead he healed the sick he opened the eyes of the blind he cast out demons from people this is the divine the divine doesn't sleep the divine doesn't get affected by the tangible realm so my beloved it is quite okay for the human side to speak to the divine just like us don't we talk to God so as Jesus as the man spoke to the divine that was in him two separate entities my beloved so the human spoke to the divine it's quiet okay question two my second question is is it okay if I'm eating pork well if you're not a Muslim then it's okay <laughs> if you are <laughs> go back to your prophet <laughs> my beloved Christianity doesn't have this is good and this is bad this is okay and this is not okay everything is good because everything came from the good God including the pig who created the pig God well this good God how can he create something that is not good impossible but when you read in the old testament the third book in torah leviticus chapter 11 the lord god warned the israelite nation of what to eat and what not to eat from as far as animals are concerned so he was referring about the pig, one of the animals that you cannot eat its meat. Why? Because the Lord God in Leviticus 11 says, any animal that has its hoof not split, if it's one piece, the hoof, the bottom of the, of the foot, if the hoof is one piece, you do not eat from that animal. If the hoof of that animal is split, you can eat that animal. It is okay the pig the hoof of it is one piece but I've, I've mentioned this so many times I'll mention it again my beloved pay attention the Lord God was not talking about animals the Holy Bible both Old and New Testament is one book that is the salvific book of God to the humanity God is sending his salvational message to the human race so when you ever whenever you approach the Holy Bible approach it as the salvific book of God it is not about um, animals geography whatever it is spiritual salvific plan of God to the human race so when God spoke about animals spoke about trees spoke about the birds he was sending a profound spiritual message for our own salvation and redemption do not eat from the pig because the hoof is not split it's one piece the word eating here means do not mix when you want to explain something to a kindergarten child you cannot talk to a kindergarten child like you talk to an adult a mature person when you whenever you speak to little kids you need to use colors pictures items you need to show them why because the brain is not mature enough to fathom what you say at a very mature level you need to go down to their level so when you come to a kindergarten child you say here is an apple and here is another apple how many now two apples okay when the child looks at things and colors it gets printed they'll never forget God's wisdom will always look at us 
as kindergarten level children, even if I am the Pope. Any wisdom placed next to God's wisdom, it's nothing. God's wisdom is infinite. What wisdom can withstand this infinite being and his infinite wisdom? No one. So when God is talking, he's talking to us as if we are in at a kindergarten level. So he's going to come to me and say, Marmari, come here. Do you see the pig? Yes, Lord. Okay, I, I'm going to teach you a lesson with, through this pig. Okay. Now, do not eat, meaning do not mix. The hoof is one. The human being is made out of two main components. There is the body and there is the spirit. These are the two main components that make up the human being. But what tied them together is something called the soul, S-O-U-L. So God created the soul to tie the spirit to the body. But the main components of the human is the body and the spirit. The Lord God is saying, do not mix eating meaning mix because when you eat something what happens to that something you just ate it got mixed in you true or not so eating here meaning mixing do not mix with someone whose hoof is one piece other words body and spirit are one god saying do not befriend such people that you cannot differentiate between their body and their spirit. What does that mean? There are some people, if they sit with someone like me, they'll be spiritual. There is no one else but them. But when they sit with someone in a club, they'll be like Satan, there is no tomorrow. You cannot be with Christ and with Satan at the same time. You cannot drink the wine that God, that Christ has given you, which is his body, and you cannot drink the, drink the wine of drunkenness which Satan gives you. You cannot come to the church and to the club. You cannot be in the light and in the darkness. You cannot, you know, be everywhere. You need to decide either the light or the darkness, either the church or the club, either Christ or Satan. The one who is one piece, meaning he is for all. He is for the church and for the club. He is for Christ and for Satan. He is for heaven and for the world. The Lord says, if you mix with such people, they will veer you off my path. You'll end up nothing. Neither this nor that. A split hoof, meaning you can tell if this person is spiritual or if this person is worldly. You can tell when it's split. You sit with someone for a couple of minutes, the moment they start talking, you can say, oh, this guy never goes to church. Straight away, you can tell if it's split. It is okay to have a friendship with such people when you're able to differentiate between the two. Because maybe if somebody is in the world, if you befriend them, hopefully you can pull them back and bring them to Christ. But if someone is spiritual, definitely befriend them because you need such friends that will take you to the Lord Jesus, not to Satan. The pig, my beloveds, when, when its eyes are staring at the, at the ground and the pig loves filth, swims in filth. If you give a pig a bath, it will go nutcase. It will go crazy. A pig cannot stand cleanliness. The pig must be always filthy. The moment you wash them clean, they go crazy. They love swimming in filth. And as long as their eyes are seeing the filth, the mouth never shuts up. Oink, 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 all the time. You know how they used to steal pigs in the good old days? before the tranquilizers came on board, they used to time it. They would run 
as fast as possible to the pig and the first thing they would do to the pig is turn it on its back the moment the eyes of the pig sees the sky heaven it shuts up you bash it you kick it you punch it you sh you shred it to pieces it will not make one whisper one sound as long as the eyes see heaven the moment the eyes see the filth never shuts up there are people when you when they talk about the world they never shut up they never shut up the moment you speak about Jesus sitting in the midst of them the moment you bring Jesus into the topic everybody goes quiet those who go quiet don't mix with them because they're not interested in Jesus so why are you befriending people that are not interested in your Lord yes so it's got nothing to do with the pig the Jewish people got it wrong and they taught it wrongly to Muhammad that's the truth so the truth is painful <laughs> but that's the truth when you receive Jesus Christ the Lord elevates you way way above and beyond this kindergarten level I mean we start at kindergarten level but we can't sleep there we need to progress correct we need to one day graduate from uni hopefully <laughs> so I can't stay at a kindergarten level but the Lord he has started teaching us from a kindergarten level so it's not about the pig it's about the behavior that is in the pig which is similar in humans those people who love the filth don't mix with them those people, once they, they speak about heaven, they go quiet. Don't mix with them. It's not about the pig, my beloved. The Lord God was teaching a profound message through animals because all of us are little children compared to his infinite wisdom. Look, it's okay to eat pork, but not too much. At the end of the day, uh, it could cause uh, high cholesterol in you, like it's very oily. So don't eat too much. Eat in uh, moderation. Should be okay. And uh, do test bloods every now and then. You should, you should be okay. Here we go. Another question. Are you tired? You're too quiet. I thought um, maybe I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> Hello, Bishop. I'm inspired by your teachings. We thank the Lord. I live in the United States. Texas is my state, and whenever I have free time, I do watch your sermons on YouTube. Everything you teach about just has my full attention. Well, we thank the Lord Jesus. I do have a question. It may sound loony, but I love thinking outside the box. In the Bible, everything that is happening right now, as I type, the Bible says all these prophecies have to happen for Jesus to come back. Question. My question to you, way before time, do you think someone or a group of men read the Bible and when they came to the point <clears throat> where all this have to happen for Jesus to come back, do you think they said, well, let's do this and do that and let's see if Jesus will come back? In other words, do you think they are creating these prophecies on purpose just to see if Jesus will come or not? Well, the answer, in short, of course not. I'll give you just one biblical verse from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 5. In Revelation 1, 5, it says the following. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Who is the ruler over the kings of of the earth Jesus Christ the faithful witness in other words every prime minister every president every king is appointed by Jesus Christ not so-called voting even if they tamper with them like they did in America yeah they tampered with the voting system Trump won but they brought Biden 
Some people will remain blind. Why? Because they do not want to acknowledge the fact that there is God in heaven who sees everyone and everything. And this God is in control always. And this God, his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the ruler over all the kings of the earth. He appoints them and he removes them. It is the Lord, my beloved. Now it's up to you to accept it or not. You're free. But at the end of the day, everyone will come to this realization and this truth. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Do you know why Biden came? Who forgets even his own name, and I'm saying it with respect. I'm praying for this man, for his salvation. But it is a, a message to the American people. This is from the Lord America. America has walked away from Jesus Christ of Nazareth big time. Big time. And America will fall. Because any nation, any human being, any kingdom that denies the Lord Jesus, does things against the Lord, offending Jesus Christ, that nation will fall. 100%. Where is the Assyrian Empire? Where is the Babylonian Empire? Where is the Egyptian Empire? Where is the Macedonian Empire? Where is the Persians and the Medes Empire? Where is Alexander the Great, the Macedonian or the Greek Empire? Where is the Roman Empire? Where is Great Britain? It is no longer great. It is Britain, but it's not great. Because when you walk away from Jesus, you cannot stay strong. You cannot. The Lord allowed a president to come who forgets his name because the Lord is saying to the American people, just like Biden forgets his name, you have forgotten my name. Get it, America. Get it. I allowed it to happen. It wasn't the Freemason or the secret societies who played with the voting system. It wasn't. It was me, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When you see the other side and you see how awesome Jesus is, the most powerful nation in the world is nothing. The most powerful people in the world who control the world with money and with power, they're absolutely nothing. But the Lord has his own timing. The Lord has his own ways of dealing with humanity. Through his infinite wisdom, he knows how to navigate everything and everyone. Just because he allowed you to do certain things, that doesn't mean you're free, my dear friend. That doesn't mean that he's gone on holidays and you can do whatever and you can get away with it. You are mistaken. A time will come sooner or later. You must give an account to the almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is God revealed in the flesh. God revealed in the flesh. So, my beloved, nothing happens without Jesus' knowledge of it. Satan is wise to a certain degree. He uses his wisdom for evil things. And by the way, Satan does exist. Yeah? <laughs> it's not a myth. It's not a human uh, sort of... Uh, uh, perception of things no 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 Satan does exist and he's doing whatever he's doing in the world now and he's doing whatever he's doing in the church as well he has infiltrated the church not only the world the world is his long time ago but he's infiltrated the church as well but 
Satan is absolute ignorant compared to the wisdom of Christ. The Lord can do something and Satan wouldn't even have a clue what has hit him. So that's why the Lord is not concerned what Satan is doing. Because nothing surprises the Lord. The Lord surprises everyone, but nobody can surprise the Lord. Because he knows what will happen before Satan knows, before any spirit knows, and before any human being knows. He, the Lord knows everything, my beloved. You need to trust the Lord Jesus. No matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, whatever the situation you are in, I don't know, but the Lord knows what you're going through. Entrust everything in His capable hands and say, Lord, you deal with it. But my beloved, for someone to come along and create these prophecies in order for Jesus Christ to come back, that day will never happen because nothing happens without Christ's approval and without Christ's prior knowledge. Rest assured. So prophecies are the Word of God. Nobody can tamper with the Word of God. Nobody can add or, or subtract not one dot, one zilch to it, because God is capable enough to preserve and protect His Word from any tampering. So um, prophecies will, will be fulfilled and the Messiah will come back. And there are certain things that will take place in Israel before the second coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to His holy name, my beloved. All glory. Hello, I live in Fiji. Aloha. But I have been watching Marmari Emmanuel preach on YouTube for some months now. Man, I didn't know I was that famous. Now I'm also known in Fiji. What else do I want? I must be so blessed. I'm coming to Fiji, brother. And I really like the way that he humbly and simply points to Christ and humbly and simply explains his homily messages. We thank the Lord, all glory to his holy name. I'm finding that I want to know more about your church and your worship of the Lord. And I would like to start off with two questions as follows. Number one, given the fact that sacraments must normally be administered in person, how might someone living in Fiji be able to join and participate in a church located in Western Sydney? I'll, I'll book you, I'll book a flight for you, my dear friend. I'll buy your ticket. Come here in person and participate in the sacraments of the church. You're absolutely right. Sacraments can only be fulfilled in person. You can't sit in front of a TV and assume this bread now is going to be the body of Christ and this wine is going to be the blood of Christ like some people do. There are these prosperity preachers, right? They say, sit in front of the TV and put a glass of water and we're going to pray over it. Get a life, mate. I don't mind um, grabbing a couple of these prosperity preachers, man. I'll, uh, uh, they need to go through uh, some schooling and be educated the right way. Stop, stop deceiving the flock. You will answer to Jesus Christ. Stop deceiving the flock. So yeah, I'll, I'll book your ticket anytime, my dear friend. Send me an email. I'll be more than happy uh, to book your flight and you come here and we'd love to have you here and join us in person uh, and receive the body and the blood of Christ. However, you know, I, I encourage you to continue watching. Um, the word of the Lord is the reviving word. It is the truth. And the more we... Um, allow ourselves to be open to the Word of Christ. The Word is capable of changing us inwardly more than outwardly. And that's when we will come closer and closer and closer to the Lord Jesus. I encourage you to continue watching. And if you ever have any questions, please never hesitate to um, emailing us like you did now. The second question, does the Assyrian Church of the East teach and subscribe to the so-called lines of Seth view of Genesis chapter 6 or does it subscribe to the so-called angel view? No, my dear friend, we 
uh, acknowledge the lines of Seth. The line of the, the angel's view is a myth. Some people think or believe that the fallen angels, when God kicked Satan and those spirits that went with him, when they were kicked out of heaven, those angels came on earth and be one with the human beings. That is a mythology. That is nonsense. With all love and respect. For a simple fact, angels do not have a gender. They are neither male nor a female. They cannot produce and reproduce. God created the angels. Whatever number he created, that will remain forever and ever and ever and ever more because angels don't have genders. So for angels to join with humans and produce giants or Nephilims, whatever, please, can we move away from this? This is non-biblical at all. So yes, we do follow the line of Seth, my beloved. We do follow the line of Seth. Now, if you don't know, Adam and Eve had Cain, the first one, and then Abel, two sons. They had daughters as well. It's not our topic. Some people think there were people before Adam. No, no such thing. No such thing. So there was Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother Abel. And then the Lord God gave them another son that replaced Abel. His name was Seth. In our language, we call him Sheth. Seth. Now, the lineage of Seth from Seth to Jacob, Jacob who was called later on Israel. From Seth to Jacob, this lineage was referred to as the, um, the children of Elohim, 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 the Trion God. So this was the lineage of Elohim from Seth to Jacob. Now when the Lord God said to the children of God, Elohim, the children of Seth, all the way to Jacob. He said, do not mix with the daughters of men. Who were the daughters of men? The lineage of Cain, the condemned one. Do not mix, do not marry from the lineage of Cain. But they did because they looked at their women and they were beautiful. Good old Assyrian, uh, not only Assyrians. <laughs> they could have been Italians, I don't know. So anyway. So when they looked at their girls, they saw them beautiful. So they said, God, time out. <laughs> I'm going to get Rachel. She's too beautiful, man. What do you want, you want me to marry Surya? Surya is ugly. So he went, they went and married from the lineage of Cain. They gave birth to giants. Who is a giant? A giant is a human being that says, I acknowledge there is God, but I will challenge him. That is a giant. Is there giants in our time and age? Yes. There are people that say, yes, there is God, but he is in heaven and I am God on earth. He cannot do nothing. I'll do whatever I want. That is a giant. What does God do to giants? Plug them from their roots at the end. They will exist no longer. He will plug them. All right. Do we have time? Maybe another 15 minutes. Okay, this question. Hmm. I ask this question with the utmost respect and would love to see an answer on YouTube, on your YouTube channel, because it is important. No problems. You, you are watching on YouTube now, I hope. Question number one. Why do you worship on Sunday? God said in the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath. He never said, remember my resurrection. The Sabbath is not only for the Jews, but for all generations. The Sabbath is the seal of the Lord. The mark is Sunday. Even the Pope has said Sunday is their mark of authority. So why do we worship on Sunday instead of a Saturday Sabbath? 
We've answered this question so many times, but we will answer it again for the sake of the person who's asking this question. And I'll say this with utmost respect. Why does the church celebrate the Holy Mass on Sunday, not a Sabbath, Saturday? For the following reason, my dear friend. If you are going to take the days of creation as literal, then we've got a problem. When you go to the book of Genesis and you read chapter 1 and 2, and it talks about the days of creation. Now, in chapter 2, it says that on the seventh day, the seventh day is the Sabbath. Sabbath means Saturday. On the seventh day, God rested from everything He had made, He had created. So if you're going to take the days as literal, where the Lord God said to Moses, sanctify Sabbath, make it holy, it is my day, on this day you come and worship me. If you are going to take that Sabbath as a literal day, then we've got a problem. Why? Because when you look at Genesis 1, from day 1 to day 6, every day has a beginning and has an end. The Holy Bible says, day 1, and there was an evening and there was a morning, day 1. Day two, there was an evening and there was a morning. And throughout the days two, day six, there was an evening and a morning. Evening meaning beginning, morning meaning ending. Because the days with God, they begin with darkness evening, they end with the light morning. The days of the world begin with the morning, end with night. You want to follow the world, your beginning is in the light, your end is in darkness, absolute destruction and lostness. The day with God begins with persecution, tribulation, hardships, heavy burdens, going through obstacles. That is the evening. But your end will be in glory in the light morning. Light is life. Darkness is death. The world first gives you life, then gives you death. Christ first gives you death, then he gives you eternal life. Now, so when you look at day one to day six, there is an evening and there is a morning. Day seven, there is neither an evening nor a morning. Guess what? Day seven is still going on till now hasn't finished so therefore God is not talking about a Saturday or a Sabbath as a day and the next thing is God rested on the seventh day Sabbath my question to you my dear friend how does God rest and when does God rest you need to question this God rested. What does it mean that God rested? Does that mean that God stopped working? Well, when you read in the Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus says, My Father, till now He is working, so am I. I'm working. God never stops working. So, does God rest? Of course not. But when does God rest? The only time God rests is when I and all of you are sin free. This is when God will rest. When we are sin free. When were our sins washed away? When His beloved Son, the begotten of the Father, rose from the dead. When did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? Sunday, not Saturday as some claim. My beloveds, we are living in the end of times. You will see a lot of people talking and you will hear a lot of preaching and a lot of teachings. Be extremely careful. It is the end of times. The Lord Jesus warned us. There will come so many false prophets, so many false teachers, so many false preachers give you the wrong gospel. They will speak about the wrong Jesus Christ of Nazareth, but they come to you in the name of the Lord, but they are not. The Lord rose on Sunday. Get it. 
When the Lord rose on Sunday, my sins and your sins, those who believed in Him, He washed our sins away. When He washed our sins away, we no longer have sins. Now I can be in the presence of my Heavenly Father. When I enter in, the, in, in my Father's presence, God is resting now because His child once upon a time was lost and now is found. He was dead in sin, but now He lives because Jesus Christ paid the price of His sins by gushing His blood on Calvary. So, what is Sabbath? Sabbath is not a day. It is a person called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Sabbath is the Lord Jesus Himself. He is the true Sabbath, not a day. A day will do you nothing, my dear friend. When the Lord Jesus came, He abolished which day and which place you worship God. Jesus said, you worship Him anywhere, anytime. So we're not going to be bounded by a day. We are bounded by the Lord who is the true Sabbath. In Him, God rested. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus Christ is the only human that is sinless, has no mistake. God will only rest when He finds a human that is like Him. Jesus is like God, sinless, like God. When God finds a human perfect like Him, sinless, He will rest in that human. God the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Why are you well pleased? Because He is the only human that never broke my word. He is the only human that I can find my rest in. He is the only Son that is loyal and obedient to me, I the Father. Whoever receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I will find my rest in you through my Son. Because it is the blood of my Son that washes your sin. The day you become sin-free, I, God, rest. So when did Jesus rise? Sunday. He is the true Sabbath. So the Saturday, the Sabbath is not a literal day, it's a spiritual day called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's why we celebrate the Holy Mass on the day when the Lord rose from the dead because His resurrection is God's rest. Because when the Lord rose, the sins were washed away once and for all. For those who believe in the Lord and seek his forgiveness. Always seek His forgiveness. So Saturday is not a day. It's called Jesus Christ of Nazareth, my dear. So we don't follow days. We follow Christ. We need to elevate ourselves. There are some, pe some people claim they are Christians and they worship the Lord on a Saturday. <laughs> Unbelievable. We follow Christ, not the Old Testament. Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is symbolic. Christ is the real one. He came. That lamb that was slain in the Old Testament is the lamb of God of the New Testament. I'm not going to go back to the Old Testament and bring an animal. Christ is the lamb of God. Christ is the true Sabbath. Don't go backwards. You need to go forward, my dear. Heaven is awaiting you in front of you, not behind you. Don't go backward. So celebrate the Holy Mass on Sunday because Christ is the true Sabbath. Question two, God is the only mediator. 1 Timothy 3.5. Sorry, I'll correct you on that. It is 1 Timothy 2.5. It's not chapter 3, it's chapter 2. So it is uh, 1 Timothy 2.5.
And it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, they are talking to me now. You mentioned the Virgin Mary as a mediator, which is false according to Scripture. I'd really love an answer to these questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that. Well, first of all, I have never ever mentioned in any of, of the preachings that we've done that the Holy Mother is the mediator. I have never used the word mediator for the Holy Mother. Never have, never will. Because it is absolutely false and you are right if I had done so. So you tell me where, which Bible preach we've done. Give me that topic, give me the other uh, time and I'll go and see it. And if I had said it, I can assure you it's a human error because biblically the Holy Mother cannot be the mediator. It's impossible. But the Holy Mother is the intercessor. When you read the same chapter, 1 Timothy 2, 1. See, 1 Timothy 2, 5, it says, St. Paul is saying, there is only one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. There is only one mediator, absolutely. You cannot argue. This is the Holy Bible. But, my dear, when you read in verse 1, 1 Timothy 2, 1, St. Paul is saying, my, my beloved brethren, I beg you, beseech you to pray for one another. Intercede for one another. The same chapter, St. Paul says, intercede in verse 1. And in verse 5, he says, there is only one mediator. So now the question is, what is the difference between a mediator and an intercessor? What is the difference between mediation and intercession? We need to know because St. Paul is saying, intercede for one another. But there is one mediator between God and man. An intercessor, my beloved, is this. I'll come to you, my dear friend, and I'll ask you to, for, for help. You can't help me, but what you will say, you'll say, I know someone that can help you. Now, that person knows you and trusts you. He doesn't know me. So you go to that person and say, please, for the sake of the friendship we have, I want you to help Bishop Murray. He'll say, for your sake, I'll help Bishop Murray. I don't know him, but I know you. This is the work of an intercessor. An intercessor is somebody interceding on my behalf to someone else who can help me. So the role of the Holy Mother, the role of every saint, every saint in paradise is the following i'll go to the holy mother i'll say mother i beg you ask your son to have mercy on me i beg you mother to intercede for me at the at the seat of mercy ask your beloved son to have mercy and forgive my sins i will never ever go to the holy mother nor any saint and say holy mother forgive me or Saint George, forgive me. Or Saint Saint John, forgive me. Any saint, I will never say that because that is false. I'll ask for their intercession. They intercede, no more, no less. The the role of a mediator is when he reunites two parties back again reconciliation even in the world you have mediators you know there is a court case they try to fix the issue prior to its reaching the court because once it goes to court <laughs> there is a lot of cost so there's a lot of time wastage and there is a lot of money being wasted so they'll do some sort of a mediation They'll call the two parties and say, look, let's sit down. Let's try and resolve this matter before going to court. That's called mediation. These two parties, they were together before. Something happened. Now they're enemies. Now they're enemies. They're not talking to each other. So the mediator comes to bring the two parties into reconciliation and fixing the problem. Why is Christ the mediator? I wish I had the time 
It's 8 o'clock. We have one beautiful neighbor here has been giving us a hard time. I pray for his, for his soul and for his salvation. Because if they realized what they were doing, they would not do it. They would not do it. A day will come. People will beg for a church to be next door to them and they will never find it. Because there won't be churches. And you will beg to give up your house to have a church instead of your house be a church and that day you will not get it and now you're complaining because you've got a church next to you and you're whinging and saying there is too much noise too much noise if you are going against the church you're going against Christ you call yourself a Christian I just wonder what kind of a Christian are you you don't want Jesus to be next door to you you don't want Jesus to be your neighbor then if you reject Christ to be your neighbor then Satan will because there's either Jesus Christ or Satan you reject Christ you'll be you'll end up with only Satan but I'm, that's why I'm praying for this man doesn't matter the council can uh, find us that's okay The Lord will always rule. Always. Don't ever rely on no one but Jesus. Love everyone. Pray for everyone. But your trust must be in the Lord, not in a human being. Notice how St. Paul talks. When St. Paul talks, pay attention. It is the depth of theology. It's very deep. He is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, theologian the world has ever seen and will ever see. When he's talking about the mediator, there is only one mediator between God and man. Look how he's saying it. I'll read it again. First Timothy 2 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. No. Christ Jesus not Jesus Christ there's only one mediator between God and men and that is the man Christ Jesus in other places you see st. Paul mentioning Jesus Christ but here he put Christ before Jesus why because he's talking about a mediator between God and men who came and reconciled God with men Christ not Jesus that's theology if you want to have a taste of it Christ Jesus Wow st. Paul amazing inspired by the Holy Spirit of course but he was a very educated man very educated very wise not only a man but a saint as well a mediator's role is to reunite two parties ever since we brought God's word transgressed against him in the Garden of Eden there was enmity between God and men the gate of heaven was shut in the face of humanity there was no there was nothing connecting God with men when we when we transgressed against him when the Lord came, when the Lord came, he became that link between God and the human race. He shed his blood on Calvary, on the cross. By shedding his blood on Calvary, he washed away the sins of the world. He reconciled God back to the human race once again. So this role can only the mediator can do. And I'll leave you with it. Job, in the book of Job, Old Testament, it finishes with a question. The book of Job finishes with a question that remained unanswered for around 1400 years. Unanswered. He realized, Job, at the end of his life, that he has offended God. He is a sinner. He realized this. So he asked this question. He said, okay, 
now I realize that I have offended God. I'm a sinner. Who's going to reconcile me back to God? Is there anyone that can bring me back to God? Stays unanswered until Jesus comes. He says, I am the answer to your question, my dear Job. I am the one because I am the only mediator that will reconcile you back to God. Now, why? Imagine this with me, my beloved. I'll have to... Um, can you watch the camera for a second, please? I want to do a bit of an actment here. Come here, my dear friend. I'll put you on the spot. Come here, my dear friend. Stand here, stand here. Okay, so you can understand it more. Easier. These two beautiful young men, let's assume they were very close friends. Something happened along the way, and now they're not talking to, uh, to each other. I know them both. When I heard that they are not talking to each other anymore, I was very upset about it. I, I couldn't just uh, be silent about it, so I said, no, I'm going to reconcile them back again. This is the role of a mediator. Now, for a mediator to come and reconcile two parties, he needs to be one, the same nature. He needs to share the same nature as them. They have a human nature. Whoever's going to come and talk to them has to have a human nature. A bird cannot reconcile. A plant, a rock, an animal cannot. A human like them sharing the same human nature. Number one. Number two, he needs to be able to read his mind and to read his mind. Meaning, the mediator has to have the same level, the same intellectual level as both parties. Because I'll come to him first and see what's, what caused this division. And I'll come to him and I'll see what caused this division. When I read both minds, now I know how to come in to bring the two minds back again together as one. Now there is a problem here. One party is God. The other party is man, human. One is infinite. One, the other is finite. One is spiritual. The other is physical. Now the mediator needs to have the same nature and the same intellectual level. So, meaning the mediator has to have the same nature as God and the same intellectual level as God. At the same time, he needs to have a human nature and a human intellectual level. So he needs to read the mind of God and read the mind of men. Who has both? No one but Christ. Now God is one. God is the only being that is infinite. Who can read the mind of God? God only. So what is Christ? Perfect God. Because the only one who can read the mind of God is God, since God is one being and there is none like Him. So Christ is perfect God and perfect man at the same time. He read the mind of God and He read the mind of man and He knew how to come in to bring them back again. The only way to reconcile God to man again was Calvary the cross by shedding His blood. That's why there is only one mediator and there will always be one mediator because the mediator has to read the mind of God and the mind of man at the same time. This only Christ qualifies because Christ is the only one person that united both divinity and humanity in this perfect person of Christ. That's why neither the Holy Mother nor any saint can be a mediator because none of them have the divine and the human together at the same time. God bless you. Put your hands together for these beautiful men. So the Holy Mother is our intercessor. I beg her to have mercy on all of us. And um, that's as far as it goes. But the one who reunites me to God is Christ Jesus. The one who forgives the sins is Christ Jesus. The one who saves is the Lord Jesus. No one else but Jesus Christ alone. 
What does the Holy Mother do? Take me to her son. Because she knows the way to his heart more than anyone. She is the most faithful, the most loyal human being you could ever come across. I will always say this till the day Jesus calls me back to him through his grace. After Jesus, no one is as perfect as the Holy Mother. I challenge anyone with love and respect. You read the entire New Testament from the Gospel of St. Matthew to Revelation. Show me in the entire New Testament that Mary made a mistake. There is no mention. What do you think the Holy Spirit is afraid of Mary? Of course not. If Mary had done a mistake, he would have written it down like he did with Simon and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and the rest. But there is no mention Mary made a mistake. Why? Because she didn't. So she knows her son definitely more than all of us. Definitely. So you need to go to the experienced one. The one who's got experience. The one who knows Jesus a lot. I beg the Holy Mother, grab my hand, Mother, take me to your son. And, and secondly, can you deny your mother? She's your mom, regardless. I'm not talking about whether she is holy or not. She is good or not, but she's, a, she's, a, she's your mom, period. Then how much more can we deny the mother that was given to us by Jesus Christ, who is God revealed in the flesh? The Lord Jesus on the cross turned to John the beloved, the disciple. He said, behold your mother. John the beloved in Revelation 1, 9, he said, I, John, the servant of Jesus Christ and your brother. So the Lord on the cross says to John, this is your mom. So Mary became St. John's mother. And John to us says, I'm your brother. So what does that make us? The sons of Mary, the children of Mary. So Mary is our mother. She is our holy mother. Of course I'll go to my mother. There is no two ways about it. And if anybody says, why are you going to your mom? Excuse me. You know why I go to my mom? Because one of the ten, one of the ten commandments that the Lord God gave to Moses says, respect your mother and father so that I can bless you and give you a long life. Mary is my mother by the will of Jesus Christ. She is my mom. If I am disrespectful to her, I am breaking the commandment of God. So I need to respect my mom. How do I respect my mom? By remembering her, by asking for her intercession, by begging her to beg her son for my sake's um, salvation. I need to go to my mom and say, Mother, I need you. I am in trouble. I'm lost. I'm confused. I can't find your son. Beg you, mom. Grab my hand. Put me under your mantle. Cover me with your motherly protection. Take me to your son because you know the way. You've lived it. You've tried it out. And you were faithful till the end. Who was standing at the foot of the cross? Mary, the mother of Jesus. A faithful and the loyal one. How could I not respect this beautiful and holy mother. Of course I'm going to beg her. But I'm going to beg her to take me to Jesus. Why? Because he is the only savior and the redeemer of the world. Your son is God. My creator and my savior. Mom, take me to your son. Isn't that beautiful? It's a perfect holy family. Perfect holy family. I think I took this back on. I said something happened. I forgot. I had two beautiful young men out here. Well, I guess we come to the conclusion because we don't want to upset the neighbors too much. <laughs>
Thank you so much for your attention. Um, God willing, next Friday we'll go back to the commentary on the book of Revelation. We are up to chapter 11, so we'll, uh, res we'll resume next Friday with the Lord's grace. So um, please, uh, I'd like to see you coming and bring more people and tell more people this is, uh, this is about the Lord Jesus, no one else. This is about His holy uh, and life-giving Word and no one else. My beloveds, we need to be close to the Lord, always, always close to the Lord Jesus, because at the end, everything is a lie. Outside of Jesus Christ, everything is a lie. Believe you me. Believe you me. I've tried it. I've tested it. I've tasted it. I have seen both sides of the world. I have seen hell. I have seen this world. And I have seen the next life as well. I know who Jesus Christ is. I not only believe in Him, but I know Him. I'm not making it up. I don't need to make it up because I'm not gaining nothing out of this. I've seen the other life. Jesus lives forever. And if you have Him, you will live forever too. Step on Satan. Step on every temptation. Step on every pleasure of this world. Step on it. Don't ever lose Jesus. At the end, our life on earth is like a dream at the awakening, King David says. No matter how long I live, it can perish before I blink my eyes. So many people slept, never woke up. So many people left home, never came back. So many people went on holidays and died overseas. You don't know when the Lord will call us home. But am I ready to go back home? This is the question I need to ask myself and I need to find an answer to it. If I don't find the answer here, it may be too late finding it over there. Jesus is the only one. This is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Six foot one, long face, tan skin, brownish, crispy hair to the shoulders, split in the middle, greenish, bluish eyes. I always say, man, you're too good looking for a Jew. What's going on, brother? You're too good looking for a Jew. Normally Jewish men are not beautiful, not handsome. This guy is handsome, brother. He's beautiful. He's more beautiful than a woman. He is beautiful. Because he is. The perfect Lamb of God that loves you more than himself. We can never fathom the immensity of his love for the human race and for his beloved children, the church can never understand how much he loves us. <sighs> Love the Lord. He deserves it. Definitely he deserves it. Let's stand. Oh, don't stand yet. <laughs> Very quick announcement before we call it a day. Um, well, uh, Sunday the 13th of November which uh, according to our church's calendar, it is the first Sunday of the sanctification of the church, what we call it the sanctification of the church. Sunday, 13th of November, we will also be having an ordination of two new priests. My dear Reni, I don't need to invite you because you are the son of this house. So you already, you, invitations go to strangers. I don't invite strangers, yes? I, I, I mean, I don't invite uh, sons. Invitation go to strangers, but not to the sons. So 13th, Sunday, 13th of November. If you have the time, this is your home. Um, so we'll be ordaining two priests, pray for them. Deacon Daniel and Deacon George. Um, if maybe um, some of you have met them, I've seen them before. So they'll be ordained on um, Sunday, the 13th of November. Pray for them, for the Lord to um, give them the strength to carry on and, 
and to fulfill this beautiful ministry and, 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 and to protect this rank, this holy rank of priesthood, uh, which is the Lord's. Um, keep him in your prayers and join us on that day uh, at 9 a.m. the Holy Mass will start and during the Holy Mass service at 9 a.m. will be the ordination of these two uh, new priests um, so keep in your prayers please and I love you very very much but Jesus Christ of Nazareth loves you the most um, the other thing is the Holy Land uh, pilgrimage for next year 2023 will be Israel and Greece. If anybody's interested, please put your name and your number down and the, um, and the organizer of the pilgrimage will contact you. Um, and whatever questions you may have, concerns, whatever it is, they will address it all for you. Um, the, uh, the organizer of the uh, pilgrimage will contact you. So it is gonna be Jerusalem, Israel and Greece, these two countries. And it'll be in May 2023, second half of May. Um, I'm not sure, don't quote me on this, but it'll be around maybe the 16th of May uh, 2023. Israel and uh, Greece. So put your name and number down if you're interested to join us. And we go together and we have fun. Look, I don't tell anyone, but I joke on the bus, uh, you know, and uh, I, I tell nice jokes. They're normally repeated 100 million times. They're as old as my, my looks, but I don't have any new jokes. So if you have any new jokes, please uh, send them my way. I know Francois has been sending a lot. I've been not, not able to catch up, but please keep on sending. Uh, but if you have any beautiful jokes, okay, not very naughty, okay, so be careful. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have to go to confession afterwards. <laughs> um, but please send me your jokes so we can have fun when we are in the bus and having lunch and uh, having dinner. Uh, I believe it was absolutely beautiful, this pilgrimage. Uh, the group was very happy, I believe. Uh, everybody had a good time, and, and everybody came back and went back home uh, intact and in, in, in one piece. That's the main thing. I, I thought uh, it was going to be a bit difficult, you know, coming out of all the lockdowns and things, but it was extremely smooth. At the airports, customs, everywhere we went. We went to Georgia, Armenia, and Israel um, throughout the journey. Uh, absolutely smooth. In fact, it was a lot easier than previous years prior to, uh, to the lockdowns. Prior to that, it was, it was very easy. Um, Israel, normally, uh, you've you got to go through certain processes, but they were extremely uh, friendly, extremely helpful. So we thank uh, the people of Israel. Um, and uh, Georgia, stunning. The reason why I went to Georgia, because of the 13 church fathers of the East, where I come from. Assyrian, 13 Assyrian church fathers. Uh, I was, when I was standing on the very grounds that they stood and lived, I, I felt I am not, I was not worthy, and I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to stand in a place where holy men stood back in the seventh century. Seventh century, 13 church fathers of the East, Church of the East, Assyrians, some from Iraq, some from Syria. Dawud, Yohanna, 7th century monks, the Lord Jesus came to one of them. He said, I want you to leave Syria and go to Georgia. When we went to the monastery which he established in Georgia, it is in the middle of nowhere. He lived in a cave. It can only fit a person squashed. In a cave he lived. The monasteries that, were, that, are, that are still there. And, and the Georgian people, to them, these are their saints. And we are not talking about them. Us, the Church of the East, Assyrians, we're not talking about them. It's a shame. The Georgians, to them, they are their fathers. Proud fathers. We went to one of the monasteries, it's still alive, has about 70 monks in it. 70 monks. It was established in the 7th century, 1300 years ago. And the monasteries, how, the way they are built, and the way the caves that were carved into the mountain, it only tells me one thing, the hand of the Lord Jesus was there. Impossible to climb that mountain, let alone to dig a cave, carve it into the, 
into the rock. Impossible, impossible. The mountain is like a standing wall, vertical like this. And it's smooth and it's a rock. You cannot neither go up nor come down. In the seventh century, what tools, what cranes? It was either the Lord came and dug it for them or he sent them an angel or he made them fly. Impossible, impossible. The hand of the Lord was there. You see those monasteries, you see the Lord Jesus. We went into one of the caves where Saint John Yohannan, he was from Syria. <laughs> he lived in this cave. When I tried to go in there, I, I was a bit hesitant. So dark and so the roof, it's a rock, it's a mountain on top of you. He lived in that cave. There was an opening in the top of that cave. It's still there. The Lord used to send a bird with food to the monk via a bird. You know, who's, you know what kind of a pet he had? A snake. Because the mountain is full of snakes. The tour guide said to us, we were there in autumn. Normally autumn is a bit cold. Snakes don't come out, normally in summer. The tour guide said, when you leave the bus and you walk, please be careful, there are snakes there. His pet was a snake. The snake used to protect him from other animals. And you tell me there is no monks there is no nuns the church of the east doesn't have monks and nuns excuse me where are you sleeping read the history of your church before you talk oh man I'm, we went to this village Kenda 800 families, all Assyrians. About 3,000 people live there. Now, we, we visited this beautiful church. Father Seraphim, I don't know if you've seen him on YouTube. He's the, the one who he sings in a beautiful you know, melodies, Father Seraphim. Yeah, we, we met him there and we had a good talk to him. Very holy man. Anyway, I came out of the church. I looked at I mean, 50 meters away, there was a man and a woman standing uh, outside the house. From a distance, I said, these are Assyrians, man. You could tell. I smelled the Assyrian blood in them. So I said to the, to the, to the, <laughs> to the group, I'm coming back. Where are you going, Bishop? I said, none of your business. I'm, I'm going to say hello to these people. I, I'm Assyrian. I, I can't deny my roots. I'm proud, and I'm proud to be an Assyrian. And you should be proud to be an Italian, English, whatever you are. You'd be proud of your heritage. Don't ever, don't ever deny your heritage. Don't ever. So I walked to them and I spoke to them in a Syrian. I said, Shlam Alokhun. Hello. And they replied, Shana, welcome. So they took me inside. Typical Assyrians in Middle Eastern, you know, typical you know, Middle Eastern culture. Come on. I said, no, I've got the bus waiting. No, no, no. You're not going anywhere. They didn't know who Marmari was. No TV maybe. No, I don't know. But now, actually, the son, the son follows me. I remember now on, on Facebook. He said, "I follow you, the son." So he, uh, we walked in. They uh, they produce grapes and wine. They live on that. Oh, stunning! He had all kind of grapes, beautiful, and he makes wine. He gave us one one bottle. I'm confessing now. I don't drink wine. We gave it to the bus driver. I mean, he drank it after hours. <laughs> But it was, it, was, it was amazing, like seeing, walking in the footprints of the church fathers was incredible. Armenia, uh, again, uh, very alive, the monasteries there, the churches, stunning. Stunning. So it was beautiful. Okay. So if you want to go to the Holy Land, and, is, and this time it's going to be Greece, uh, put your name and number down. And let it be the Lord's will. Let's stand for the finale prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, 
It is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you and protect you all the days of your life, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless. See you next week.